Okay, experiment four deals with the macro scale recrystallization of acid analyte. So this is going to build upon what you did in experiment three um, as we will be determining what the optimum recrystallization solvent is for acid analyte and then using that um, recrystallization solvent to recrystallize about a five gram quantity of acid analyte. And so we'll go through all of the steps that were shown at the end of the um, experiment for handout. So need to note ahead of time that your pre-lab assignment uh, is to be completed in your notebook. There are no uh, questions for this lab. There are no pre-lab questions. And so there's nothing to turn in electronically. You'll be turning in the cop carbon copy sheets after you complete the experiment. Uh, and we will be grading not only the, what was assigned in the pre-lab assignment, but also then the completeness of your observations data. And during the experiment, you want to make sure that you should that you know any uh, sources of product loss during the experiment. That just means if solid doesn't quite, if solid ends up in the receiving flask or in the filter flask and has moved through the filter paper. Um, you want to note that if it's stuck to the glass stirring rods, etc. So along the way, you will be asked to identify product loss. So make sure that that's included as an observation in your notebook. In the pre-lab assignment, you're going to outline the procedure in the two-column format, the left hand. You're going to outline the procedure, leave the right-hand column blank for changes, um, observations, and data. And then you're going to look up the solubilities of acid analyte in uh, various solvents. Uh, and you're going to use the Merck Index and the CRC Handbook for that. You want to make sure that you include the references and page numbers and, more importantly, the volumes of the Merck Index and CRC that you use uh, when you look up those values. And there will be a, uh, there's a handout and then another quick sort of lecture video on these different resources and, and finding information about organic chemicals in the lab. And that video should be, the handout and video should be right below the link for this video. So what we're going to start with is exactly what you did in experiment three last week. You're going to determine the best recrystallization solvent for acid analyte. There will be a number of solvents, um, the same solvents that you use, used in experiment 3A. You're going to use small disposable test tubes. You're going to add a small amount of the acid analyte to each of the test tubes, add a small amount of recrystallization solvent, see which whether the material dissolves at room temperature, whether it does not. Um, if it doesn't, then you're going to go ahead and heat the solution up in a hot water bath. If it then dissolves, uh, then you're going to cool it back and see if it recrystallizes from solution. You're going to do this part of the experiment um, in groups, or in groups of two or three. Uh, and then once you find out what the best recrystallization solvent was, you're going to calculate how much of that solvent you'd need to fully dissolve five grams of acid analyte. That is, this is why you need to look up the solubilities of acid analyte in the various solvents from the literature references. So, because you won't know until this experiment which one you're going to find is the best. Um, and then to make sure that we make a supersaturated solution, if you find out that you need, for instance, 100 milliliters of that solvent, you're only going to use 50 for the macro scale recrystallization and that to start with, and that will uh, allow then the, the make sure, sure that the solution is supersaturated so that the material will crystallize um, as you cool it back to room temperature or in an ice bath. So the process that is listed for using a single solvent to do a macro scale recrystallization is the last page on the handout for experiment four. Um, this is just a copy of that. And so I'm going to show you pictures of how we're going to go through that with the acid analyte. But I just want to review that. Number one, we're going to dissolve the solid in a minimum, and that's a critical word, minimum amount of the hot recrystallization solvent. So that's why we're only going to use 50%. And if we need to add more recrystallization solvent during this experiment, we will add um, we'll add it by pipette full. Then 
if the solution has a color to it, we could sometimes remove color impurities by adding a small amount of decolorizing charcoal um, or carbon to the hot recrystallization solution. The decolorizing carbon will actually then absorb the color organic material and hopefully the solution will then become clear. Um, and this is important if the solid is supposed to be a colorless solid. Then the carbon, so the carbon um, does absorb the color impurities. Then we take the hot solution, we filter that, usually by gravity filtration to remove any insoluble material and also remove the re decolorizing carbon that we just added. Um, we're going to use gravity filtration using what's called fluted filter paper. That's the, those are what are folded up, sort of like a coffee filter. We have fluted filter paper, and so you don't have to actually um, fold it yourself. So we're going to do gravity filtration, um, and then we're going to take that hot filtered solution, and we're going to allow that to cool slowly uh, to allow the large crystals to grow. And, well, that was supposed to be one of your um, conclusions from experiment 3B, um, that slow cooling will lead to large crystal growth. So we're going to allow that solution then to produce the hopefully purified crystals of acid analyd. And then after the recrystallization solution has been cooled to room temperature, we're going to put it in an ice bath and then hopefully recrystallize as much of the material as we can. In general, you can sometimes promote crystallization um, by scratching the side of the flask with a glass stirring rod. And it has to be a glass stirring rod because what happens is that the glass stirring rod scratching the glass flask causes little microcrystals of glass to form, which form which form seed crystals for, in this case, the acid analyd to um, further crystallize. And so if your solution doesn't crystallize, that is one way to do it is to scratch it with a glass stirring rod. If you scratch it with a metal spatula, you're not going to get crystals most of the time. So usually it's a glass stirring rod that we use. And then once we have those crystals, we're going to go ahead and filter those by vacuum filtration. We're going to use the Buchner funnel, which is the large funnel that you used last week. And we're going to use a, a filter flask. And we're going to attach that not to a water aspirator, but we're using our vacuum system. And hopefully you watched the video from last week on how to set that up and make sure that it's clamped properly. Then once we have the crystals, um, on the Buchner funnel with a piece of filter paper. We are going to then add a small portion of the ice cold solvent, in this case, whatever that solvent is. Mm -hmm. um, and then if the solvent used for recrystallization is fairly volatile, mm -hmm. then we try and dry the crystals as much as we can by allowing air to flow through the crystals while the vacuum is on to the vacuum flask. Um, if we're using a solvent such as water, that's not necessarily going to dry the crystals. Um, sometimes we will dry the crystals overnight or we'll place them in an oven for 10 or 15 minutes to dry. Uh, we will also take the crystals in this case and we may put them on lar uh, two large pieces of filter paper. We'll put them on one piece of filter paper and then place the second piece of filter paper over the top of them. And then you can kind of press them to try and use the filter paper as if it was a paper towel to dry the crystals. We put the the uh, fil we put the crystals onto either a watch glass or an aluminum weighing dish. Remember, we do not put them on filter paper and then put them in the oven. The crystals go onto the bare watch glass or the bare aluminum weighing dish and then into the oven to dry. Now, if we were really really particular about this experiment, we would determine the mass of the crystals and then we would basically dry them to a constant weight. And you've done that in general chemistry before where you've taken and allowed this and allowed, I think with the crucibles you did that, allow the crucibles to cool and then you put them and you determined when they were at a constant weight that means all the solvent has been evaporated. 
And then we're going to go ahead and take the melting point of the crude material and the recrystallized material to see how different they are. Remember that what should happen is that the melting point of the crude material should have a wider range and a lower number than of the purified material. So what we're doing is we know that the material has is sufficiently pure when we get a nice narrow um, melting point range and the melting point um, really is very close to the literature value. Otherwise we have to, to recrystallize the sample until we get um, that, until we get those, uh, until we get basically a constant melting point. Okay, so here's what we're going to do. We're going to start with acid analyte, which has been, um, which the crude sort of a, uh, a non-purified uh, type of acid analyte has been purchased. Uh, we recycle this from year to year. And I add impurities, like I'll throw little charcoal things in there. I'll throw some sand. Sometimes you'll see some scraps of paper thrown in. In the really old days, the the professor I used to teach with when I started 20 years ago, he, he used to throw cigarette butts and all sorts of stuff in there. But this will be impure, and it'll have sort of a grayish-brown tinge. We're then going to put that material into our appropriate amount of solvent. We're going to heat that solvent directly on the hot plate, so that begins to narrow down some of the possibilities for the potential solvent that you'll use because we normally don't put solvents on hot plates. Um, we don't put all of them on there because they tend to catch fire. So this is going to be one that's non-flammable. And then we're going to also place a portion of that solvent so that we have hot solvent um, ready to use in the, in the remaining steps. So once we start to heat the solution, what you'll see is you'll see the insoluble materials begin to sort of collect at the bottom. The acid analyte will begin to dissolve. We're going to put a glass stirring rod into the um, Erlenmeyer flask so that that way it acts as sort of a boiling stone. And then we're going to heat the solution up until all of the solid dissolves. And we may have to add small one or two or three milliliter portions to this until all of that solvent dissolves. The 50% value that you're going to use is, in essence, going to be sort of the bare minimum. And so if we have to add more, that's OK. We just add small portions. We don't want to add too much and then have our acid analyte not crystallize when it cools back to room temperature. OK, so when we have the solution, you can still see that this hasn't completely dissolved yet, but it will. You can also see some of the impurities that have been added to this solution. Then we add our decolorizing charcoal, about what whatever the quantity says in the handout, about that much. When you you're going to take the um, you're going to take the Erlenmeyer flask off the hot plate, pour in the decolorizing charcoal and then put it back on the hot plate. And what you can see here is that the solution has gotten cloudy, which means some of the acid analyte has actually precipitated from solution. So as I heat this solution up more, this will become clear. It won't become colorless, but it'll become clear. So we want a nice clear solution because that tells us all the acid analyte has dissolved. So once we get the solution um, to be relatively clear, we, and we might add to add, again, a couple more milliliter portions of the solvent to make this work, then what we do is we kind of preheat the plastic funnel. Because if I pour the solution into a cold funnel, what's going to happen is the crystals are going to immediately crystallize. So we just kind of heat the um, funnel up by placing it on top, and then that the steam that's produced or the hot vapors will actually heat this up. Then we're going to use our fluted filter paper to place inside of the um, plastic um, the plastic funnel. If it was me, well, this was me, I would clamp this up and make sure that it doesn't tip over. Um, but apparently I'm a professional, so I didn't do that when I took these pictures. So you want to make sure that you put your fluted filter paper in the plastic funnel, and then you're going to carefully decant the solution into 
the fluted filter paper and notice I'm using my stirring rod and good general chemistry technique to pour the solution then into the fluted filter paper and then that will gravity filter the um, impurities and the decolorizing charcoal. So then I'm going to always have some, maybe a little bit of solid and, and the impurities left in my Erlenmeyer flask. So what I would then do is go back and use these, this portion of hot water, pour a little bit of that hot water into this flask, and then maybe if I see some white solid still there, I might heat it up to dissolve that, but then I'm going to then pour that hot solvent that hot mixture back through the filter. So if any crystals formed in the filter paper, this hot solvent, that second pouring, will basically dissolve those and move those through to the final um, to the final solution. So at, at this point, this solution should be relatively clear and colorless. Um, if decolorizing charcoal did make it through the filter paper, it'll give this a little bit of a grayish tint. If necessary, we can re-filter re, uh, that. Then you're going to allow this to cool to room temperature. You will start to see crystals grow. And then we're going to put this into our ice bath, scratch it, and we'll begin to see, in this case, uh, much more purified crystals start to grow. And if this picture was in focus, you would see that these are actually nice, large, plated crystals. We're then going to go ahead and use our Buchner funnel and filter flask to go ahead and suction filter. Again, this should be clamped up. And we wet the filter paper with the solvent that we used to recrystallize. We're there, then we're going to decant this solution into the um, filter flask. Then we're going to wash um, with a couple of portions of ice cold solvent, allow the air to sort of flow through the crystals for a few minutes, and then scrape them out onto a watch glass or an aluminum dish. We're going to determine the mass of the crystals, so you needed to determine the mass of the uh, dish before that, so we're going to determine the wet mass. Then we're going to place that in the oven, allow it to dry for 10 15 minutes. We're going to pull that out, remeasure the mass to determine how much water was lost, and then we probably won't do a second drying, <clears throat> but if the crystals still look wet or they still look clumpy, then we would want to take and um, dry them a second time. So then we're going to take this recrystallized material, the original starting material that we worked with, we're going to take melting points of both of those to compare how much we've purified the material. Appearance is always a qualitative test of purity, so we can see how much we've qualitatively purified by looking at the appearance. Acid analyte should be a colorless solid, and so if it still remains a gray to brownish color, then that means that uh, we still have a few impurities in there. So when it's done, it should be a colorless solid like this. Okay. So that's what we're going to do for experiment four. Determine the recrystallization solvent and then go ahead and do the um, macro scale recrystallization. So you're going to determine the mass of the wet crystals. You're going to dry directly on the aluminum weighing dish or a watch glass. Remember, no, you don't leave them on the filter paper because if they melt, they melt into the filter paper. Determine the mass of the dry crystals after they've been dried. You're going to determine the melting point of the impure and the recrystallized solvent. And then you can determine the percent recovery of the acid analyte. Um, there isn't really a literature value to compare with. And since we know there's impurities in the mixture, we know that you could never get 100%. So um, we really don't have a literature value. We're just going to determine how much we recovered from the initial um, five grams. Okay, so at the end of the experiment, you're going to turn in your recrystallized acid analyte in the aluminum dish. You want to make sure that your name, uh, number, section number, and the experiment number is clearly marked on the underside of the dish, not where the crystals are, because if you mark um, the inside of the aluminum dish with a sharpie and then put crystals on it, guess what? They're going to be whatever color. Sharpie you used. So always underneath. 
Um, we will be taking this solid and recycling it. Um, I probably have solids that have been recycled for a good part of the last 20 years. Uh, we will be grading it um, on appearance, uh, but for the most part, um, if you do a decent job, then you'll get full credit. All the liquid waste, since they're only water, and maybe some decolorizing charcoal and maybe little bits of paper, you can dispose those dispose of those down the drain um, with copious amounts of more water. And then you will be turning in a report, and it's a report format for this experiment the following week. Uh, there is a Word document available on Blackboard for you to fill out because the report form that you will be filling out, you will turn in both the paper and the electronic copies. Okay, and that's all that will be due for the report form for this experiment. So there'll be the pre-lab assignment and your notebook pages, and then the lab report format, and I believe that's all that is um, due for this experiment. So that's, that's what you'll be doing for experiment four.